And so then on this slide, I just tried to summarize what are some of the challenges that are associated with the environmental monitoring of AMR? So first of all, where should we monitor? Um, we could consider monitoring various different environmental compartments. We could think about monitoring in the manure. So what is the level of microbial AMR that's present in the livestock manure in that manure management system? And we could also look at the soil. We've looked and we can detect antimicrobial resistance in the soil. So we can see after the manure has been applied to the land, what kind of changes are occurring to the bacteria that are naturally in the soil. And then of course, we also wanna think about monitoring our water systems because that's where we often think of that exposure through recreational activities. Uh, that's where that may be taking place. Um, but when we think about what kind of detection um, would be able to represent uh, the presence of AMR, uh, it can really look at it in two ways. One is a genotype and one is the phenotypic resistance. Uh, phenotypic resistance is when we're actually uh, growing the uh, bacteria that are resistant to ant different antibiotics on a, a, a rich media. And so we can see which organisms grow and we know for sure if they are resistant to different organisms because we can actually see their, their growth and the, and the expression of that risk resistance. Um, another really important method is the genotypic. So this would be using qPCR type methods uh, where we would look to um, identify different markers or different genes that are uh, that are responsible for some of those resistance behaviors, such as the efflux pump. Um, and in doing that, we can use these qPCR methods to try and determine the level of resistance of these certain genes. But a real challenge here, as with the phenotypic resistance, is that there are a wide suite of different antibiotics that are used by humans, that are used in animal production. And so uh, many of those genes are specific to certain targets. Um, or specific antibiotics. And so there's a large suite of potential indicators of resistance. And we're just now starting to learn uh, which of these are really able to move through the environment and which could be important for monitoring. And then finally, the resolution of sample collection. Uh, when we think about uh, the effort to monitor our um, environment, uh, it's, it's quite challenging. Uh, you can think about monitoring at points where humans would be present. So uh, thinking about the risk to public health. Um, we could also monitor in locations that are closer to where runoff may be coming, um, closer to sewage discharge points. Um, and how often do we collect those samples? Do we just collect them uh, once a year? Do we collect them after runoff events? Do we collect them um, during the time of year, maybe when manure application is occurring? And so from that, you can see that there's a lot of different open uh, questions and challenges that are associated with the concepts of environmental monitoring for AMR. Now I'm gonna turn it back to Shannon and she's gonna tell us about some of her uh, research on antibiotic monitoring. Thanks, Michelle. So I'm gonna talk about two different watersheds that we have monitored in Nebraska. First, the Elkhorn River watershed, which is shown on the left part of the slide. This is a watershed that is um, highly agricultural. It has a lot of animal feeding operations and really uh, kind of drains an, a northeast uh, portion of the state of Nebraska. Uh, in this blow up, you'll sort of see the names of some of our sampling locations. So we have locations that are upstream of um, the Fremont, Nebraska wastewater treatment plant. We were also sampling within the wastewater treatment plant um, effluent because as we've mentioned, uh, our municipal wastewater is also a source of antibiotics to the environment. Uh, the plant is located a distance away from the Elkhorn River. And so we also, we sampled the effluent, but we also sampled the outfall where the, where the effluent mixes uh, into the receiving stream, which in this case is the Elkhorn River. And then we've sampled downstream of the plant at, the, at, a, at a research station, which we call the Elkhorn River Research Station. A second watershed where we've done also quite a bit of sampling over time is the Shell Creek watershed. So the Shell Creek watershed, you can see in kind of uh, uh, north, a little more central, central Nebraska. Um, this is a much smaller watershed. Um, it's a very agricultural watershed. So there's relatively few people living within the watershed. 
Uh, many more head of animals and they are predominantly beef cattle and swine. And so we have different sampling locations that we have monitored um, from the town of Lindsay, Nebraska, uh, Platt Center, and then a couple of different locations, including a location where the USGS has a gauging station, which gives us continuous flow information for Shell Creek. So a little bit of data. Um, this is data from a study we did a number of years ago in Shell Creek. Uh, one thing that you can see on the left-hand side is the land use and the population. So the pink dots kind of correspond to the different um, populations, the communities in the Shell Creek watershed. You can see that the largest community is about a thousand people. Um, you can also see that it is very largely agricultural. So the brown land use, planted, cultivated land um, really predominates in this watershed. But what's not shown in this figure is there's also a lot of animal agriculture and animal production. So this is just a very intensely agricultural watershed um, from both a crop production and an animal production perspective. Um, on the right side of the slide, you see some of our data on antibiotic concentrations that we observed in the watershed. And these are averaged over a full um, monitoring season, which is usually March through November. So this doesn't really get at seasonal differences. My next slide will show a little bit about seasonal differences, but you see some of the common um, antibiotics that we detect in um, Nebraska watersheds. So we commonly will find um, compounds such as lincomycin and menensin, as well as uh, sulfa antibiotics are also um, antibiotics that we commonly detect. And you'll see with these box and whisker plot, that really kind of represents the range of concentrations that we observed. And we can see a fair amount of variability in concentrations over the course of a monitoring season. If we look at a different study, and this study now contrasts uh, the Elkhorn River, which has more of the municipal wastewater input compared with Shell Creek, which is more of an agricultural watershed, you see a number of differences. First, if we look at the left-hand side, um, the Elkhorn River data, you see first that some of our highest concentrations are coming from our wastewater um, out, uh, treatment plant effluent. And this is not unsurprising. Uh, wastewater is disinfected seasonally. And so here we sampled spring and summer. Those are the periods of time in which wastewater is uh, disinfected before it's released into the water body. And so you see in fall, after that disinfection season is over, we do see much higher uh, loading of antibiotics in that wastewater effluent. Um, you also notice that the outfall location in the Elkhorn River um, had the next highest total amount of antibiotics. And these are stacked bar charts, so the different antibiotic classes, and you can see those labeled um, this study, we had a much broader number of antibiotic classes that we were investigating. You see that they are a number of antibiotics are detected in these various locations, but that that outfall location in stream had the next highest concentrations relative to the outfall. Despite that, we still did detect antibiotics both in the upstream location, so ahead of that wastewater effluent. And we also find that these antibiotics, as Michelle mentioned, are mobile and persistent. So we also found them at this more downstream location. And so whether they were contributed at that downstream location uh, from a combination of that wastewater input, as well as, as surface runoff um, from neighboring cropland, we're still seeing the occurrence of those compounds um, you know, in our most downstream sampling location. In Shell Creek, this is a watershed that is really um, not at all dominated by municipal wastewater. There certainly is septic, you know, septic systems or smaller treatment systems, but this is very predominantly um, driven by manure application to cropland. And so in this watershed, you see, first of all, the scale is different. So we see much lower overall concentrations in Shell Creek, although we still are seeing these compounds detected. Um, and we're finding some, seeing some different trends. And so some of our sampling locations, we see higher concentrations in the spring. Uh, we typically attribute that to kind of a, a spring flush 
or these compounds might be um, building up on the soil surface and then get carried off kind of those first precipitation events at the beginning of the spring. Um, but we also sometimes see some higher concentrations in fall and those fall um, events are typically sampled in October or November. And those could potentially just correspond to periods of time when the base flow is lower. Therefore, the concentration of antibiotics may be a bit higher. <clears throat> 